My name is Stephen Millard. I'm the Deputy Director here at NISA for Macroeconomic Modeling and Forecasting, and it's my absolute pleasure to chair today's event. Um, let me, let me uh, first go through the running order. Okay, I'm going to uh, make a, just a couple of opening remarks, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Barry Naisbitt, who will run through the outlook for the global economy. Paula Becherano Cabo, who will run through the outlook for the UK economy, and Anna Arnab Bhattacharji, who will run through the outlook for UK regions and households. That should all take around about 35, maybe 40 minutes, after which there'll be ample time for questions. If you'd like to uh, put any questions um, into the chat as we go, then I will uh, pick up the questions on the chat and hopefully, if everything is working well, I will ask people to unmute themselves and ask their question. Uh, we're aiming to wrap this up by around about quarter past midday. Okay, so uh, just ahead of uh, the more detailed analysis, let me let me just put forward some key messages that have come out of our outlooks this time around. The, fir the first one, which we're going to see very shortly, is the world growth we think is going to lower to a persistently low level. So the high growth rates of world GDP that we saw right up until um, the, glo the global financial crisis and then the pandemic, we, we think uh, they are not going to maintain into the future. Turning to the UK specifically, well, <laughs> Uh, UK GDP per capita growth is um, more or less zero for the first couple of years of our forecast, but certainly UK growth is in the doldrums. High interest rates, both in the UK and elsewhere in the advanced economies, will increasingly draw down on demand. Within the UK, regional inequalities are likely to persist, and poorer households are going to face little prospect of an increase in living standards. Um, And uh, just as a little sneak preview of the uh, autumn statement, the two things we very much support, one is uh, an increase in public investment, and my colleague Paolo will talk about that, and the other is increases to the national living wage. So on, on those points, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Barry Naisbitt, who's going to run through the outlook for the global economy. Thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, good morning, everyone to our Autumn Economic Forum. Um, our uh, global view, um, as usual, we prepare using our global macroeconomic model, NIGEM. Um, some of you may well be subscribers to NIGEM, others of you may not be, but may well be thinking about doing so. So um, please, please do talk to us if you'd like to do so. Um, the team of people who worked on this, um, my thanks to them, particularly to Jana and Ahmet, who uh, done an awful lot of the work. Um, what do we see as being the main themes, if, if you like, um, of the global outlook in the next few years? Well, Stephen has mentioned one, which is the, the idea of lower rates of growth than certainly we saw here before the global financial crisis. Um, but within that, one of the key things that we think is happening at the moment is a transition to positive real rates of interest following a long period where, met, particularly for the advanced economies, real rates of interest were either negative or very close to zero. Um, within that, um, one of the things that's happening is GDP growth is slowing and we think likely to remain weak. And, and by weak, we're talking about 3% a year, around that sort of rate. Um, the other sort of big theme that's going on is, is really around inflation, particularly in the advanced economies. And we're clearly seeing that headline inflation now fallen in the advanced economies, but core inflation is sort of following down, but much more slowly. Um, and within that, um, in terms of what policies might be used to boost growth or help uh, sustain great rates of growth, well, monetary policy is already tightened um, and fiscal policy is partly constrained, in part by, of course, the tightening of monetary policy 
which has raised interest payments as a share of GDP in those countries. So let me just sort of go through some of those themes and illustrate them with um, figures that come from our document on the global economic outlook. So the first one is, is around monetary policy tightening and the transition. Um, and we're, we've clearly seen in, in taking the euro area in the US as examples, a very sharp and very quick tightening of monetary policy. Maybe it was a bit late, but be that as it may, we've now seen um, this tightening. And, and our view really is that interest rates in both the euro area and the US, short term policy rates at least, have most, most likely peaked. Um, it's not to say there might not be some further increases ahead, but our forecast is based on them having peaked. Um, what does that do to real interest rates? Well, we see once interest rates have peaked, they stay at their peak for a while and then gradually start to come down. And if you look on the right hand side chart there, you can see our view of short term real interest rates. Um, the, the diamonds on the far right hand side represent sort of averages for the period 26 to 30. And you can see there that um, a contrast um, between the experience of, let's say, 2022 onwards compared to the last, the previous decade, where real interest rates in these economies are going to be positive. I mean, Japan possibly an exception to that, um, but moving towards positive territory, um, whereas before that they were negative. And what we're seeing is part of that adjustment to that transition. In terms of economic activity, well, oddly enough, um, the first half of the year, probably economic activity has been a bit stronger than we were expecting three or six months ago. However, now um, there are clear signs. We believe that economic activity is slowing. Um, when we were putting this together, of course, the uh, US Q3 GDP figures just come out, which showed a great deal of strength. But then only the other day we had the euro area showing a fall in. GDP in Q3. And one of the features, in fact, on the left hand side chart, you can see a sharp rise in service activity in the first half of the year, um, particularly noticeable in China when the Chinese economy opened up again and particularly to trade and foreign travel. Um, but now um, that impetus, that momentum has gone. And in terms of real activity, the tiger indices from the Brookings Institute show that both are advanced and emerging economies, the, the trend is of one of losing momentum rather than gaining momentum. If I move on to um, the outlook for GDP growth, we expect it will remain weak. Um, GDP growth in, a, in advanced economies, um, numbers around one and a half to two percent a year. Um, we're expecting this week to be, this, this year to be lower than that, I mean, certainly in the euro area um, and probably only just about one percent next year growth in emerging economies as much more of a mixed bag um, China and India still performing strongly or relatively strongly but of course there are emerging concerns about the growth rate of the Chinese economy going forward um, we're thinking of growth this year in China of 5.1 percent but 4.6 next year 4.7 the year after so again slightly slower growth in india around six percent a year over that period um if we move on to the next chart please um one of the i suppose bright spots in what looks like a fairly dour picture is uh, the labor market particularly in advanced economies Labour markets remain tight. Unemployment rates, have, despite the slowing in GDP growth, unemployment rates have not picked up noticeably. They, they have picked up in some countries, but th there haven't been substantial rises in unemployment rates. And we're not, we're not really expecting unemployment rates to rise rapidly. We think that uh, adjustment will occur elsewhere. Um, in the euro area, um, again, the euro area unemployment rate as an aggregate is actually quite at a relatively low level for the euro area. And we're expecting um, some increases in um, Germany and France a little bit, but um, 
Otherwise, we're, we're looking at a relatively stable outlook, we believe, for sort of labour markets in, in terms of activity in them. And the big picture, really, or the big, the big story over the last year or so has really been about inflation. And we think that headline inflation has now peaked in the advanced economies, particularly noticeable um, on the left-hand side chart, where you can see that uh, the US inflation rate peaked earlier than the euro area. Uh, Japan um, looks to peak, but looks to peak sort of very early this year rather than last year, but is sort of pottering along, but still at a, a lower level than the other economies. However, core inflation, while also looking like having peaked, <clears throat> has not come down anywhere near as slowly. And that obviously reflects the fact that energy prices are a very big factor in explaining the rise in headline inflation and the subsequent fall in inflation. But we think that um, certainly monetary policymakers are going to be very aware of the importance of core inflation and wanting to see um, signs of core inflation falling uh, sustainably towards target before loosening policy. So we've moved to the next chart, which looks at the outlook. We can see that uh, in, in terms of our outlook, we're expecting inflation to come back down towards 2%, but slowly. And probably the key word we put up there is patience. So we're, we're ex if you like, expecting both us to be patient about inflation coming down, but also central banks, particularly in advanced economies, to be to show some patience about inflation coming down and not keep raising interest rates. But of course, that means that they will be relatively slow, we believe, to reduce interest rates sustainably. In emerging economies, a more mixed picture, but again, inflation coming down uh, sustainably, but obviously to a higher rate than in the advanced economies. Um, fiscal buffers are limited. Um, rising bond yields have obviously played a part in increasing debt costs as a share of GDP across many economies. And public sector to debt, debt to GDP ratios are elevated. Um, we see prospects for falls in those rates, albeit gradual and slow falls in Canada and the euro area. Um, but the US looks to be a bit of an exception there. And China, while having a lower debt to GDP ratio than those other countries on the chart, we look to, we expected to see to be rising just a little bit over the forecast horizon. Um, it's already well presenting a central forecast, but what about the risks? Well, in the near term, one risk might be that monetary policy has been over-tightened. And that could uh, produce a more recessionary picture than we're actually showing. Another one is the high level of public debt and how governments respond to that and what they want to do. Um, the next two issues that we talk about are really things that uh, are sort of worrying CEOs at the moment around geopolitical events. The war in Ukraine is continuing. We now have a Middle East conflict. And there's, there's clearly concerns about increased uncertainty and reduced confidence as a result of those. In the medium term, um, we're expecting growth in China and perhaps some other emerging economies, uh, in, uh, India, for example, to moderate. Well, that plays a part into keeping lower global GDP growth than we saw a couple of decades ago. And advanced economies are likely to make a lower contribution to global GDP growth. Um, because they'll be showing slow growth themselves. In terms of what the picture looks like in terms of contributions, it, it sort of looks like the world economy is very like, in some ways, the economy that we saw in the 2012 period up to 19, where, again, there was talk about slow growth um, and in particular, the slowing growth of the um, emerging economies relative to the rather rip roaring rates that we'd seen in the 2000s. And um, we see that continuing. In terms of our forecast, this is the uh, just our summary table. World GDP growth about 3% this year, coming down a little to 29 next picking up a little bit to, to 3.1. Medium term, 
from the range 2.7 to 3 percent. The consumption deflator, OECD deflator, falling from a peak of 10.9 percent last year, gradually falling and in the medium term coming to around 2.6 percent. Um, let me leave you with that and thank you for your attention. I'll now pass on to my colleague, Paula, who's going to run through the outlook for the UK economy. Thanks, Barry, and good morning, everyone. I'm Paula Bejarano Carbo, and today I'll be talking about the prospects for the UK economy as presented in our you know, autumn outlook, which is very much a joint work with my colleagues uh, listed on the screen. So I'll start with GDP. So our outlook for GDP really hasn't changed too much since our August outlook in that uh, we see GDP remaining and GDP growth remaining sluggish throughout our forecast horizon. That said, our central forecast doesn't expect to see a recession in this time. So in this figure, the black line is our central forecast and the fans represent a probabilistic range of values in our forecast. So focusing on the short term, we expect GDP growth this year to be 0.6% and next year 0.5%. And relative to the bank's recent monetary policy report, our forecast for this year is actually the same, but our forecast for next year is actually slightly more optimistic. So the bank expects uh, GDP to flatline between the end of this year and next year. And as I said, that's slightly more optimistic, but really the difference isn't that significant. The sort of overall picture and overall narrative of sluggish growth remains. And to contextualize that, uh, in the graph, you can see that the pre-financial crisis average for GDP growth is just under 3%. So really by historical standards, GDP growth is underwhelming. Um, and these sort of forecasts, if they're 0.5% above or below zero, really doesn't matter. The overall narrative of sluggish GDP growth uh, remains. And this is largely a um, result of past monetary tightening bearing down on demand. Um, the last thing I'll say on this slide is just that, as you can see, the risks are balanced to GDP. Thanks, John. Next slide, please. Yeah, so turning to inflation, the latest data indicate that CPI inflation was st you know, held steady at 6.7% in September. And we expect this to actually fall quite dramatically in October. That's due to a base effect. So last year, there was a quite large increase uh, in energy prices, which we expect to fall out of the CPI basket. Um, in October, and that data will be released uh, next week. Um, so um, this figure of 5.1% for October uh, compares to a bank figure of 4.6%. You might interpret that difference as us expecting energy prices to drop out, but potentially be replaced by some inflation, whereas the bank just expects them to, to fall out. Um, we expect uh, CPI inflation to reach just under 4% by the end of 2024. Um, and the target to be reached towards the end of 2025. Uh, so in the medium term, we expect the bank to be reaching its target. Next slide, please, John. Thank you. Um, so the bottom line is we think monetary policy has done enough. We think interest rates have peaked and the bank will hold them for about a year or so before beginning to loosen. Um, so this chart over here plots uh, latest outlook with our summer outlook in red and the market curve uh, as of 26th of October in black. So just to focus on the gray and black lines, um, it seems that we have the same view as the market in that interest rates have peaked and that the bank will hold them. Slightly different views about how long uh, bank will hold rates at peak and slightly different views about where we think rates will settle. So we think rates will settle at about three and a quarter percent, implying um, that we have a view of the real interest rate about one, 1.5%. Whereas the market might think that rate is about 2%. So these sort of diverging views in terms of the pace at which to loosen and where interest rates might settle sort of indicate maybe there's scope for greater MPC communication around these issues. Next slide, please, John. Thank you. So while we think uh, MPC has done enough to reach its target and despite inflation falling um, in uh, you know, these last couple of months, since you know, peaking at 11%, um, public confidence in the bank continues to fall. So this graph uh, charts sort of inverted CPI inflation in black and compares it to net satisfaction. So just focusing on that sort of lower right-hand side, we can see that even though inflation has sort of fallen, um, 
net satisfaction in the bank continues to worsen. And that's actually driven by subgroups, um, men and mortgagers, which historically have had a more positive association with the bank. Um, and those subgroups have actually sort of turned, um, you know, and, and have sort of become more dissatisfied recently uh, with the bank. And this is, you know, potentially concerning uh, because satisfaction um, and confidence good proxies for trust and reduced trust in an institution like the central bank um, might be worrisome in terms of uh, the inflation uh, anchor and keeping expectations anchored. So it signals a need to improve our public understanding of the bank mandate and uh, sort of tailor communication strategies to these subgroups that, especially the ones that historically have had uh, negative associations with the bank. And this argument is much more elaborately um, sort of uh, described and well, elaborated uh, by my colleague Carolina Garriga and this is one of our boxes in the outlook so I would highly recommend reading that if uh, this is of any interest. Next slide please John. So turning to the labor market there's been signs in the last couple of months that the labor market has started to loosen but overall the labor market remains tight. So the figure on the left pl plots the vacancy to unemployment ratio and as we can see it's around 0.7%. Um, and while that's fallen from its peak in late 2021, it's still well above the pre-COVID average of just under 0.4%. And tightness in the labor market has um, enabled wage growth to remain very elevated this year. And our forecast expects wage growth to remain elevated because of this high vacancy to unemployment ratio relative to you know, historical uh, averages. Um, and our view of the unemployment rate is that it will continue to rise gently to its natural rate, which we estimate to be around 5%, just slightly higher than uh, the bank's estimate of this natural rate of unemployment, uh, but actually they've been revising their estimate sort of up towards uh, us, so uh, we're not too bothered by that difference. Uh, next slide, please, John. And another characteristic of the labor market, uh, which I'll just briefly talk on, is that um, inactivity continues to be sort of um, quite an important issue in the British labor market. Um, particularly the rise in long-term sick. So as we can see pre-pandemic, uh, sort of on the left-hand side of this chart, um, the sort of number of people that were inactive due to being long-term sick was about 15,000. And the latest data show that um, this number has increased by nearly 450,000 uh, people. So that sort of cohort of long-term sick uh, represents about 1.5% of the labor force. Obviously, this is quite um, a difficult policy issue because it's not exactly clear what can be done to sort of bring these people back in, into the labor force, um, especially once you pass that six month, month window, which you might expect to be a uh, sort of window in which um, you'd want to bring people back into the labor force. So whereas the chancellor has um, implemented measures recently, such as increasing childcare allowance, um, to target some of these groups uh, that are inactive, including those looking after the family or home. The long-term sick issue is far more complex and the absence of a very um, clear um, policy option, it's probably something that's gonna continue to characterize the UK labor market going forward. Um, next slide, please, John. So the bottom line with fiscal policy is that our forecast see the chancellor, uh, sees the chancellor meeting his fiscal targets. So net borrowing will be below 3% by the end of our forecast uh, horizon and net debt, as you can see in the gray line, is falling uh, throughout our forecast horizon. And the reason why that's happening is that the primary balance, that black line um, from you know, 24 fiscal year onwards is turning into a primary surplus. So that paired with uh, the nominal growth rate of GDP being higher than interest rates uh, sort of is creating a, a environment in which uh, these fiscal targets can be met. Uh, next slide, please, John. So it's not just the case that the chancellor is meeting these fiscal targets, but we, we estimate that the chancellor has fiscal space. Um, and so we recommend, as my colleague uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, using this fiscal space to invest in public sector, in the public sector, um, as well as uh, raise the national minimum wage or national living wage. Um, what we would not want to see is a pre-election tax giveaway because evidence shows that tax cuts really don't have um, as good of a long-term impact on um, structural, you know, on output, on productivity as, for instance, investment does. And we think having this sort of 
longer term view of fiscal policy and how fiscal policy can best be utilized to sort of grow the UK economy and tackle issues such as our productivity slowdown would be really essential. And so as we've been pushing for the last few months, we'd really like to see an increase in public sector net investment to at least 3% of GDP. Um, next slide, please, John. Right, so I'll just leave you with our forecast summary um, and pass on to my colleague Arnab. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula, and uh, before that, uh, Stephen and uh, Barry. And uh, welcome everyone to, and thanks for joining us today as we bring you our autumn 2023 outlook for the devolved nations, English regions, and UK households. As ever, this is collaborative work with a fantastic team, including Adrian Pabst, Max Mosley, Robin Smith, and Tibor Zendrai. Um, you know, um, uh, so overall, our central view is one of a little bit of hope as inflation stabilizes and wages catch up with inflation for the first time in two years. Nevertheless, regional and distributional disparities persist and are likely to even depend. So centrally, we think that absent significant public investment supported by public enterprise, the UK is set for a decade in the doldrums and poor prospects for regional regeneration. In the following few minutes, we will analyze in particular the distributional impacts of successive shocks, not least in the global geopolitical scenario as Barry was uh, underlying earlier. And then following on the outlooks for the devolved na nations of the United Kingdom and the English regions. And we look forward to the chancellor's autumn statement. So starting with households, our key messages for UK households are well, slow recovery from the distributional shocks. So there is now real wage growth for low-income households, um, but that is lower than that for high-income households. And a higher proportion of income is spent on elevated energy, food, and housing costs, which have remained high and will remain high, uh, despite inflation coming somewhat under control, prices will remain high. And thereby, living standards as measured by real household incomes of people, not only at the bottom of the income distribution, but all the way up to the median. So people in income deciles two to five as well will not return to pre-pandemic levels until the end of 2026. So that is a, a rather negative um, outlook. So to set this in context, let us look at what has been happening uh, over the past uh, several years. So uh, we had been having narrowing wage inequality for a period since the global financial crisis, whereby incomes in the bottom decile, they were rising a bit faster than incomes for the median uh, individual and household. Here, this plot is only for wage earners, so people who are not, not the self-employed, does not include the self-employed. But then since the uh, pandemic, the picture has been the opposite, and we now see higher, uh, a, a widening disparity between poorest and median earners. Now, moving on, so what does that imply then, particularly in the context now of real wages rising for the first time in two years, whereby wage growth is on average is slightly higher than inflation. We look in particular at the benefits of high minimum wage, national minimum wage and living wages on households in the bottom two decals of the income distribution. And we find some impacts there. And the bottom decal, we find an impact particularly on consumption, even as wage income and benefits income some, some, somewhat cancel each other out. And in the second decile, we find an increase in uh, incomes, uh, uh, household incomes. That is largely because minimum wage and living wage, they benefit people in work, 
rather than people on benefits. So there's a five to six percent rise in consumption in in 23, 24 in the in the bottom uh, uh, black aisle. Now, as might be somewhat uh, obvious from this, is one of the things which is also happening, which we see on the next slide, is the change, therefore, in people's participation in the labor force. And this is an important issue because particularly with rising inactivity or inactivity staying very high, not that much impact on the bottom decile, but in the second decile, we see both inactivity and unemployment falling by two to three percentage points, which is about 0.3 percentage points overall for the entire distribution. But within this particular 10th of the population, it is two to three percent drops in inactivity and unemployment rate. So rises in minimum wages and the uh, national living wage is having a positive impact on the labor markets as well, and which is one of the reasons why we would like to encourage the chancellor to consider further raises as uh, you know uh, that might be considered in the autumn statement. Moving on to the next slide, increases in real wages, not only at the bottom, because of rises in minimum wage and living wage, but also throughout the distribution has important implications for destitution. Our projections show that the number of destitute people falling to around 1.1 million by the end of 2024. This is relative to 1.5 million in the previous year. And this is largely as a result of the uh, rise in minimum wage, living wage. Um, but sadly, this 1.1 million forecast includes approximately 300,000 children. In fact, children are in poverty are one of the uh, biggest, uh, you know, um, it, it's a tragedy that so many children uh, uh, would uh, are facing food poverty. And the highest concentration is in London, which at the same time as having some of the uh, biggest wealth in the country also houses a lot of poor people. So there's enormous disparity in London. With respect to house prices, we are now seeing or we are now projecting a lower fall in house prices, about 6.5%, which is slightly lower than what we were projecting earlier. And also a sharper turnaround since after 2025 or you know, beyond 2025. However, that still means on the next slide, a large number of people, uh, individuals and households facing uh, negative equity. So we think that that would be some 50,000 additional households, which will bring the total number of house owners in negative equity to approximately 160 to 170,000. These, these are large numbers and, and uh, you know it will be devastating consequences for these individuals. The distribution across the country, the regional picture is also quite varied. And we can see that there is particularly high incidence in the in the Midlands and in Wales, uh, and also in Yorkshire and Humberside. Moving on to the next slide, our key message is now we come to the regions, UK regions, is that almost all parts of the United Kingdom have returned to pre-pandemic levels in terms of output and employment. And UK average for productivity is projected to be above pre-pandemic uh, average by uh, the end of 2025, but also low anemic economic growth for all devolved nations and the English regions and falling productivity in the Midlands in particular. Quite disconcertingly, inactivity rate, we predict that to continue to rise throughout 24-25 across all regions of the United Kingdom. So looking at the uh, picture across the regions uh, in terms of output measured here by regional gross value added, London continues to power ahead. Uh, but otherwise, there is a mixed picture. London and metropolitan parts of the southeast are one side of the country and, and you know, there's a two-paced growth across the country. With respect to the devolved nations as well, uh, it's, it's largely very similar picture uh, across the uh, four devolved nations. 
in terms of regional output. With respect to employment, we see a much more of a varied pattern on the next slide. So once again, London is doing quite well. Um, but other, other regions are lagging further behind. Uh, uh, in particular, the Midlands, uh, you know, uh, employment levels will struggle to reach pre-pandemic levels even by 2025 or so. That this is the Australian central projection at the moment. Actually, the situation is a bit worse for uh, some of the devolved nations. With respect to regional inactivity, as I mentioned earlier, we are projecting inactivity to rise a little bit across all the devolved nations and regions, in English regions. So the picture is quite uh, grim in that respect. Moving on, um, productivity, not that much of change across the regions, except that London is going to see a bit of a increase in productivity against a very high level relative to other regions uh, and devolved nations anyway. However, this masks some severe structural issues relating to London itself. John, next slide, please. Um, the productivity paradox in London is that while productivity has been high in London, its, its uh, trajectories have been somewhat disconcerting. Here you can see the period uh, you know, before the pandemic, and uh, it was quite uneven, uh, the um, uh, you know, trajectory since the global financial crisis. And this raises serious concerns. What we have in the Outlook chapter is a box by Adam Youssef looking more specifically at London's productivity paradox. And in particular, this points to several important features for London and the need for public policy there. Uh, John, next slide, please. So much better coordination across multiple tiers of government. As ever, London has this problem where there's the central government in Westminster, there's the Greater London Authority, and there's you know local governments in the London boroughs. And we encourage greater coordination um, between those and targeted public investment. Once again, public investment is an important feature uh, in this outlook, and that follows on from the uh, discussion that uh, Paula had as well. To deliver more affordable housing, better access to more affordable transport, um, greater R&D spending to bring about innovations, and greater business investment in line and crowding in uh, public investments. So overall, we want to encourage the uh, government to think strongly, the chancellor in the autumn statement to think strongly about um, investments, going up to 3% of uh, GDP, rather than the current target of 2%. And we think that that is within the fiscal space of the government, particularly given the uh, boost to uh, taxes uh, uh, coming about, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as a result of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the thresholds and so on. So capital spending on physical and digital infrastructure, as well as housing, we think will boost uh, economic growth, uh, but also productivity and help unlock more business investment um, on which our shared prosperity and well-being, they depend. And uh, radical, uh, somewhat progressive public economic and social policy is required to avoid another period of protracted trans stagnation. Um, without this, the UK risks falling further behind other advanced economies and regional disparities will continue to widen. So our concluding thoughts are households in the bottom half of the distribution uh, require sustained real wage growth. And uh, we encourage the chancellor to look carefully at this. Housing costs and negative equity need to be addressed. And we need a convincing vision, as I was mentioning, of regional and national renewal. Um, 
with a long-term program of public investment targeting physical and digital infrastructure, very importantly, knowledge, innovation, and on the one hand, and human capital and skills on the other, and public services, notably housing and health plus social care. Um, putting this, without putting all of these together, we are looking at a, uh, at, at a, a rather negative picture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Paola. Um, we have some questions here. I'm going to take the first one from Russell uh, Bradshaw. Um, Russell, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, it was a question related to uh, the inactivity rate. You mentioned that uh, the direction is up. I was wondering if you had any quantitative forecasts of that trajectory. Yeah, so we uh, we do. Um, the thing to bear in mind, though, is that this is the inactivity rate defined by uh, the inactive population aged over 16 uh, to the total population aged over 16. So the the inactivity rate that most people normally look at is uh, is that for the working age population. Um, and and the thing is that we think the inactivity rate defined over the working age population is going to be roughly flat, but there's a, a demographic shift towards a, an older population, which has a higher inactivity rate typically. So this, this is why the inactivity rate that Arnab was showing you is actually rising. I, I hope that all makes sense. So but flat for working age. Flat for working age. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Arnab is going to be busy, I, I sense. Um, I have a question here from Bharti Kashwara. Bharti, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi there. Um, yeah, so my question was, um, you mentioned um, the income deciles two to five, um, and I just wondered what proportion of households or number of people um, are in those income deciles, because you said that... Um, their living standards um, would not return to pre-pandemic levels, I think, until 2026. Yes, uh, thank you, Varti. Uh, so this is, each decile is a tenth of the population. Okay, so uh, two to five would be about 40% of the total population. Uh, you know, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, so it is 40% of the total population. Perfect, thank you. Bottom line is that's a big number, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, next question is from Charlie Hopberg. Charlie, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, oh, yeah, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, I was just interested to know if there's any more detail or your view on the underperformance in the Midlands and what's driving that, whether it's a certain area. I presume it could be something to do with urban parts of the West Midlands or whether it's... Uh, reliance on manufacturing or, or different sectors. Um, yeah, just intrigued on the relative underperformance of the Midlands in particular. Um, I, I suppose that's me. So, um, uh, Charlie, uh, uh, fantastic question. So we have been thinking and, and researching this quite a bit. We think that uh, there are two different things, means the East Midlands and the West Midlands are somewhat different. In the West Midlands, it is largely urban areas and particularly manufacturing, which has uh, struggled since the pandemic and followed by uh, the Brexit process and so on, so and has not recovered fully. In the East Midlands, uh, this trading activities have uh, suffered quite a bit. Now, uh, of course, we have revisions to um, our um, UK aggregate output for the pandemic period uh, with a higher inventories uh, of uh, uh, finished goods and and uh, you know intermediates and uh, that that in the east midlands that has a big impact on um, you know so coming from the trading sector but it is not clear to us as yet how far the manufacturers have been able to pass on the corresponding higher manufacturing and trading costs on to consumers or how long they had to wait in order to do that. I think this combined uh, effect of these two things is is one of the reasons why the East, uh, in the Midlands are suffering. So as a result of this, there's also continued pressures on, um, you know, uh, 
stagnation in employment really in, in, in these regions. Yes, that's our prognosis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Cheers. Thanks, Arnab. Um, I don't have any more questions at the minute. So uh, please, please, please think of a question to ask it. Um, in, in the meantime, I was, uh, I was wondering if um, maybe, Barry, you could say a little bit more about uh, the transition the world economy is going through, both in terms of the slowing down of uh, GDP growth, the slowing down of trade growth, and and the uh, the move from a negative to a positive real interest rate world. Sure, Stephen. I I suppose um, one of the things I've been thinking about. I mean, this might this might all be nonsense anyway. But one of the things I've been thinking about is reference periods that we use um, for our thinking about what the future is going to be like. And I still think in a way that um, many macroeconomists are still a little bit stuck in the pre-global financial crisis world of thinking that global GDP growth is going to be somewhere around 4.5% a year, perhaps. Um, advanced economies growing by, say, 2% and emerging economies growing by 6 or 7 perhaps even 8 um, And have put down the sort of slowdown that we saw in the 2010s, really just to the global financial crisis rather than anything you know, else structural going on. And I think our view is that there are structural things going on. And in particular, one of the structural things is some of those very fast growing emerging economies in the early 2000s and even the late 1990s are now seeing slower GDP growth as their real income levels rise in those countries, as they move towards the frontier, if you like. They're not at the frontier necessarily, but moving towards it. And that's going to lead to, you know, a period of global economic growth that is that is sort of slower than the reference period we tend to refer to. Um, now, part of that also is that even within the period that the, the 2010s, etc., we we were in a period where I think most people would agree monetary policy uh, interest rates were abnormally low, um, and we think we're the partly the rise in inflation by itself, but partly other factors that mean that that period was going to come to an end at some point anyway is meaning that we're moving back towards now positive real interest rates over the period that will, in a sense, reinforce almost that, that period of slowdown. Maybe not terribly significantly, but meaning that in in the way I think I try and present it, we need to sort of perhaps rethink our reference periods and think about what, um, what really does the world economy look like? Where are the growth rates going to come from? What is propelling it? And that's sort of what's driving our forecast, really, in terms of um, seeing advanced economies growing by sort of one to two percent a year and emerging economies growing by sort of four to five percent a year and coming out overall around three. I, I don't know. I mean, other people may well disagree about whether we're stuck in the past. Um but I, I, I think it's just an interesting thought for, for many things in economics about what the reference period we want to come back towards using. So I hope those thoughts help. They, they, they do indeed, Barry. And the, the, the bottom line here that, um, you know, we, we kind of always compare with the past. And actually, you know, the world economy is changing all the time. And uh, the idea of comparing it to a particular point in time in the past is, is maybe not the... Uh, not a winner. Um, okay, I have two more, two more questions have appeared during that brief chat, so uh, let me give the opportunity to people to ask them. Uh, Jim Nugent. Jim, would you like to um, unmute yourself, or maybe maybe you can't, actually? Uh, so so I'll, I'll ask the question um, and see who wants to have a crack at answering it, because it's not an easy one. Anyway, the, uh, Jim's question is, can we provide some insights on the outlook for the corporate sector and how performance might differ between SMEs and larger firms? Um, 
So, uh, what is the outlook for the corporate sector? Uh, my my guess is pretty grim, given that <laughs> we're not really expecting some demand to be rising at any time in the near future. Um, Arnab, I don't know if you've done any thinking about SMEs specifically. Um, yes, uh, um, Stephen, we have, and, and this is a great question, by the way. Um, so in in trying to think of subnational, of course, we uh, analyze the households more explicitly and the regions more explicitly than we do farms. Uh, it's just, um, you know, so where we have focused our attention on, given the, um, uh, you know, in, in some, some ways, the urgency following the pandemic. Um, but we have quite a bit of work in-house on, on SMEs in particular and uh, also on larger farms now. I am not able to completely give a picture of this now, but this encourages us in some ways to go back to this question in one of the later outlooks and try and look at this question in further detail. Now, it is true, though, uh, is uh, several things uh, come out of what we have done, the analysis that we have done. One is that the impacts of the large shocks, in particular the shocks which affect trading, um, so the Brexit shock and the and the war in Ukraine and may, maybe the new conflict in Middle East as well, uh, they tend to affect supply chains and and in particular they affect smaller farms, the SMEs more than the larger farms, and that that is something which has been borne out. Also, the struggles with respect to uh, filling job vacancies are much more apparent for smaller farms than they are for larger firms. So job postings are happening not at a brilliant rate but they are happening in the economy but i think the the smaller and medium enterprises they are finding it much more harder to fill those vacancies how much of this is skills mismatches how much of this is actually um mismatches in wage expectations we do not know that very well but we are going to continue to think about these issues and come back to you later on thank you that was it uh, so the, what my takeaway from that is it's an excellent question jim and we need to do work on it and we will and hopefully at a future forum uh, you can come back and say oh thanks for doing that work on this question I would add one thing, actually, and that the SME troubles that uh, Arnab was just talking about there, particularly with supply chains, is also related to the the what we were talking about earlier with the West Midlands, um, in that there are a lot of sort of manufacturing SMEs, if you like, within the West Midlands who are part of much larger supply chains, and uh, they they were certainly in the uh, aftermath of COVID, they were particularly struggling. Um, John Fitzgerald has a question. John, do you want, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Just, uh, uh, there, there are problems in the Chinese economy going back to um, last uh, uh, winter um, and is causing some investors to, uh, for major foreign investors, to look at moving uh, production elsewhere to Vietnam or India, for example, Apple. Do you see this uh, sort of a, a slowing in the Chinese economy, which you're, you're showing, being possibly compensated for by more rapid growth in other economies, which are uh, uh, receiving the crumbs falling from the rich man's table in China? So, John, thanks. Thanks for the question. I mean, I like I like the phrase crumbs from the rich man's table. Um, but I was, I was going to say, I mean, yes, you're right. I mean, there, there is evidence of, um, if you like, some, it's either withdrawal of or slowdown in inward investment into China from particularly US com companies. And you're also right that, that some of that investment is going into other countries like Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia. Um, and that will, to some extent, compensate for slowing down growth in China. Um, and in a sense, that's in our forecast where we have actually quite strong growth rates for countries like Indonesia. But at the same time, um, there, is a, there is something else going on, we think, um, or, well, we postulate at least, and that's something about increasing global fragmentation. 
Um, and, you know, this is really the area where, where we're talking about sort of, it's not quite trading blocks, I suppose, developing, but it's more l looser associations of countries starting to develop and starting to become closer together and moving away from what one might think of as the big general arrangement on tariffs and trades, the big gat rounds, and more development of smaller, but still obviously substantial uh, trading areas. And we've, we've written a few things on that in the past. And I, I, that, certainly the Far East, um, or East Asia, is certainly one area where that's sort of, a, I think, a very active theme. Thanks, Barry. Um, on that global fragmentation point, uh, <clears throat> Barry himself is very modest here, uh, wrote, a, wrote a box on it, I think it was a couple of outlooks ago, and um, well, well, well worth a read. Um, anyone in the audience? Okay, so we're out of questions again, so I'm going to... Um, I, having put Barry on the spot, I'm gonna I'm gonna put Paolo on the spot a second and just to ask Paolo, Paolo if you want to very briefly talk us through what um what the current view is for wage inflation over the next year or so. Sure, yeah. So as I said, the sort of tightness in the labor market has um enabled wage growth to be very elevated by historical standards this year. Um so we forecast that in 2023 uh wages grow um will have grown you know about seven percent um but it's important when thinking about this issue to sort of remember that um this follows quite quite a substantial amount of time in which workers have taken real wage cuts um and in particular as well real consumption wage cuts and so this elevated wage growth is really essential for um a catch up in a sense for for workers to to regain uh, living standards which is as arnab noted for some income decals uh, might not be until 2026 um but yeah so that tightness in the labor market which we expect will continue throughout next year as well obviously raises the the chances of wage growth being elevated uh, well into next year as well um so as i mentioned we expect it to be around 7% this year and as well around 7% next year so elevated by historical standards, but uh, necessary for workers uh, to feel that catch up in real wages. Absolutely. I think, um, well, um, I'm, I'm kind of, um, A, I think it's, it's our forecast. So obviously it's, it's our best guess as to what's yeah. going to happen at the, next year at the minute. But I was going to say it's also one that I'm very hopeful hopeful that it comes about because um as you say Paolo I think it's you know people have taken a very large cut in their real wages over the past few years and it's 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 important that we at least try and recover some of that um in the meantime Barty has come up with a question another question uh picking up on the Sumese West Midlands uh, productivity and apprenticeships so Barty do you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, ask the, your question yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so I've got two questions. The first one is, the first one is, I just wondered um, if any of your research has unearthed that um, the SMEs in the West Midlands are producing a particular drag on productivity, specifically due to their lack of investment in skills and training, either due to financial restrictions or lack of information about, you know, how they can get their workforce trained up. Um, and secondly, um, there seems to be information through networks that um, the government may be removing um, the apprenticeships levy funding for higher level apprenticeships six and seven. And I just wondered if Nisa has a particular take on that, given that, you know, skills seem to be a key component of the drag on productivity. And we do need like higher level uh, training and skilling across the across the nation. Thanks, Barty. <clears throat> I mean, on before I allow Anna to to, to come in, um, I should point you towards the Productivity Institute, uh, which is a, a collection of uh, different universities, and these are a part of that. And the Productivity Institute has done a lot of work, um, in particular, Phil McCann, who's based at the University of Manchester, on issues around, um, in particular, skills training in various areas, financial restrictions in various areas. Um, and the effect on productivity of the fact that outside of London, 
um, the firms just seem to be far less productive. But I, I'm going to allow Arnab to come in and, and answer the question. Uh, thank you, Varti, and th thank you, uh, Stephen. I hope I am audible because my computer says my network bandwidth is low. Um, okay, so it's holding up so far. Right, okay, so I think you're absolutely right, and I think your your thinking largely falls in line with how we think about these issues. There are two things to say here. One is that we think that any uh, substantive positive impact upon regional regeneration or leveling up, however you may want to put it, uh, needs the creation of good, green, and globally tradable jobs and the skills, skill sets that go with these jobs. And in some ways that ties in with both of your questions. Um, we think that there are large mismatches in various parts of the country, and that is part of the problem that we face. Um, uh, specifically about the SMEs in West Midlands, um, I need to, we need to check the research as to what it says. I cannot quote that off the top of my head, but please do come back to us and we will be able to pro provide more information. Um, and and the you know so also the skilling uh, investments which are necessary there. Uh, by the way, not only in SMEs but also in overall in you know further education uh, colleges and and more generally in the in the overall training landscape of the country. Um, and but the second point is also very important, and this we do highlight in the current outlook chapter. So please have a look there. We think that certain things were quite good means the apprenticeship program which was introduced uh, at the time of the pandemic by the wells government actually did some fairly good job uh, unfortunately those you know positive impact you know uh, impacts have run away have run off now but then there is potential for introducing these in for example in northern ireland or in the midlands or in other parts of the country and together with the restart program and so on and so forth. So we write quite a bit about this and, and we think quite deeply about uh, these issues. Thank you. This, these, are, these are very important and uh, very important points. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Arnab. Uh, Russell has another question. Russell, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, thank you. Um, so given a lot of recent Bank of England MPC reports <clears throat> for share concern around the uh, concerns around sticky inflation, hence we've been hearing a lot about higher for longer on rates. Are Nisa thinking that this risk has subsided and now the bigger risk is from um, over-tightening in rates? Carla, the risks upside, downside, balanced. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Um, so we do view the risks as balanced, so you're right in that sort of core inflation remaining sticky or persistent um, is an upside risk in inflation. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is the, the view that monetary policy has possibly over tightened and that's an important downside risk, um, which I know our colleague uh, Paul Mortimer Lee, for instance, uh, has proposed that um, the Fed in the US has over tightened. It'd be interesting to see his analysis on, on the UK. So. Short answer is we view the risk as balanced. Um, and if you remember in that sort of inflation forecast, we we had the probabilistic range uh, equal on both sides. But yeah, thank you, Russell. Thank you, Paolo. Both risks are there. Um, well, you know, the whole point about risks is we'll see what transpires over the next year. But, but certainly we, we don't see interest rates falling anytime soon, I think is the, uh, is the bottom line as well. Um, I know I said we'd run this until quarter past uh, midday, uh, but given uh, that I think we've run out of questions, uh, I'm, I'm going to give everyone uh, 10 minutes extra for lunch. Um, thank you so much for attending our autumn uh, economic forum. Please uh, have a look at the UK Economic Outlook. If you're a member or a NIGEM subscriber, you also have access to the Global Economic Outlook. Um, and you know, uh, feel free to email uh, me with with questions, comments, thoughts, um, and we we already have a, a couple of things to take away and think about. 
uh, from our from our questions today. So thanks ever ever so much to everyone, and uh, we will see you in three months' time. Thank you.